um, for leadership. Tell us the amazing things that the powerful, intelligent, forward-thinking city of San Francisco is working on. <laughs> well, please help us solve the world's problems. It has struck me that, uh, pardon me, that uh, San Francisco got a competitive city ego with anywhere, so that was uh, uh, well said for so <laughs> collectively. Um, I also know it's the end of the two days, so I'm going to try to hit some highlights here and and uh, add some things that either maybe complement things that we've talked about or once in a while maybe rebut them. Um, so um, one basis for all those wonderful things is that that, that Sean was um, suggesting that we should all question as well uh, is um, you know San Francisco is among the communities that sets bold goals and they goals I think a recurring theme is my what I'll talk to you about today is goals are often set before you entirely figured out that they can be met and how to meet them and they serve that exact sort of purpose is motivator. And so the city uh, does have detailed climate action plan, but for 90% of communication, we really boil it down to this slide, uh, which represents our primary goals of zero waste citywide, putting materials back to productive use at the end of their useful life, at least 50% of transport via sustainable modes. This is actually an out of date slide. The current goal is now 80%. Um, and then 100% renewable energy, which embodies both the um, need for to make that practical, the need for energy efficiency, as well as the supply side, and the roots representing sequestering carbon where it belongs in plants and soil. Um, one of the big motivations is that climate uh, adaptation is something that we're actually directly faced with and working on today. So this is a we're on the cusp of invent uh, sorry investing in. Uh, billions of dollars for the replacement of San Francisco's aging seawall, which is now uh, for weeks a year uh, surmounted by king tides instead of you know, once every hundred years as it was originally designed. So that's the effect of both the age of this infrastructure, but also um, just a few inches of sea level rise that we've experienced to date. Uh, and underlying this is the bulk of the city's wastewater treatment uh, storage during stormwater events as well as um, so critical to our sewage infrastructure <clears throat> because we have an older, primarily served by an older uh, combined sewer treatment system, um, as well as the BART tunnels, so the regional transit, and then behind the wall, you know, billions of dollars of some of the most valuable real estate in the world. So it's, it's imperative that we both, it, it's front and center, that there isn't really a choice of not spending money uh, in, in order to mitigate climate change, and there's not really a choice of not spending money to adapt to the, the conditions that we face already. Um, to maybe offer a, not arguing at all, but a counterpoint to, to the, some of the points that, that Ed made, is I think it's actually, that was very well presented that uh, total uh, electricity use has basically been flat, uh, loosely speaking, and then across the cities in the world that he examined. At the same time, one thing I didn't hear quite enough of early in the talk that to make me fully embrace all of the ideas is what we've seen is a the effects of you know, decoupling of carbon emissions and, and uh, actual energy consumption. And so citywide since 1990, uh, our economy's grown, uh, now it's more than double, so GDP's up 111%. Uh, the total population has increased, the total built environment has increased, and in that context, emissions are down, just closing in on 30%. And the bulk of that, the bulk of that is on the, the built environment side, that there's been lots of good successes and lots of different um, significant scale efforts, but most of the, a lot of those efforts still hold the line in some way rather than yielding deep reductions. <clears throat> um, so the city does ha has had the goal of, for, for about a decade now, of an 80% emission reduction by 2050. Yes? I'm sorry, Mary. That is just an incredible number. That's citywide yeah. consumption dropped 29%. GHG emissions from operation of buildings, transportation, and waste citywide are down 29% while the economy has grown. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just give us one, two, or three? Like, what is, what are the top contributors to that? Sure. The pie chart of why there's a reduction, or, or um, 
short version, so 47% of emissions are operation of buildings. Basically, an equal amount is transportation and waste is the balance, slightly under 10%. Um, that's, uh, we now, I think we're running at about 80% of waste is put back to productive use through mandatory composting citywide uh, that is, is enforced, uh, mandatory recycling citywide is enforced, to collection at all points of collection throughout the city. There's, uh, I think there's a 1% non-compliance rate for existing facilities, and that's basically, it's an older city, and so most of the built environment was built before we had three bins or bins, and so there are a few places in particular restaurants in some of the denser parts of the city that it's impractical to get, to find enough space. But otherwise, just that, that's that been working. There's both an economic incentive and a financial incentive. Um, the built environment, um, you know, I think it's the work partly of the, the Energy Commission and our building department in, in implementing those standards and the fact that San Francisco is a global epicenter of our architecture and engineering. Uh, and those, those three things all do contribute to, I think, some significant success and efficiency as well as ratepayers investing for you know, a long time, including our own department, uh, uh, offering incentives to um, multifamily and small commercial. That's kind of the subject of a whole other talk. Um, but um, but what's, and then transportation, some, you know, there's some similar stories. So the, um, all of the Muni uh, electrified transport, that's for a long time has been powered basically by entirely by hydroelectric. That's not a decision made entirely on an environmental basis. It's just the city pushed through putting in hydroelectric dams in Yosemite National Park. And that's, that's the downside of it. Uh, and good side of it is we've had largely GHG free power for going on a hundred years and it was about five years ago they made a commitment to cover the gap where there was over 90 percent was GHG free so that more to come <laughs> but, but it's just kind of things like that it's, and so maybe to try to ask it a different your question a different way the question is the goal of 80 percent reduction is that really feasible like, that's a responsibility driven goal and science driven goal but can we get there as a community um, and this is also trying to condense a long study into one super complicated slide, so I'm just going to wave my hands a lot. Um, but if your, your far left bar on the graph is total community-wide all-in emissions 1990, next bar is, as of a couple years ago, the, the net that reduction in emissions. If you then um, assume that utilities simply comply with existing law, so, so SB3, uh, primarily the SB350 50% RPS standard, then the combination of projected growth uh, and that reduction of carbon intensity of the grid uh, and a few other business as usual factors yields basically stasis, like the sort of similar to Ed's talk. And we'd probably have about the same carbon emissions in 2050 if we did nothing else. All the little boxes under transport and buildings are essentially efficiency is the biggest possible contributor. We did a lot of different efficiency me measures and saw them implemented at scale, but you didn't assume perfection citywide. Uh, that looked like that yielded about a two-third emission reduction. Uh, so not enough to get to 80%. If you then added PV to every rooftop, we would not look at vertical PV, but it was still a pretty much saturating the built environment. Um, it yields a pretty small re net reduction from there, again, because as we're, it's, as Amor was saying, it's the order of your applying these interventions matters. And so PV is a huge marginal impact in the grid today when we're dirtier than we'd be in the future. But um, by the time we have a largely clean grid, you, you're just going to have less impact with each marginal increase in the amount of PV on the grid. And so bottom line was we could get to about a two-thirds reduction uh, and we'd only be able to get to 80% if then we looked at not combusting uh, natural gas on site systematically everywhere. So about 97, 98% of thermal loads are met uh, that through, um, sorry, and residential thermal loads are met that way citywide. And that's partly because we have some older infrastructure that still uses electric resistance. And so electric heat pumps were basically necessary to get to 80% reduction and did demonstrate that on-the-shelf technology could get there. 
But how do we see that? How do we see all those things happen? We need all these signals sent by government and by industry to be lined up and in the right direction. And I think we look through these things, we aren't sending those signals systematically right now. So we have put in place some state rules that were designed to prevent a gas utility from trying to poach customers from electric utility and vice versa. And that now is, is in our way uh, in terms of supporting that we can't apply incentives for this type of fuel switch we need to see. Financing is a little more neutral, but also our primary policy instrument says a signal that it should be harder to put in efficient electric appliances than to use natural gas. And that we're, that's the subject of a lot of you know, good faith work to try to not send that signal in the future, but that's still a signal we're sending today. <clears throat> and then even education, we don't, we don't spend money on in industry education for kind of the same set of reasons that there's a, a fear of that ideas embedded in the prohibition of the incentives for fuel switching affecting the primary source of money that we all have for, for funding industry education is ratepayer funds. And so, um, it's a big challenge. So then if we look at uh, quickly municipal facilities uh, as you know, city should be taking the sort of action in its own facilities first. Um, look at SFO, uh, SFO is committed to a net zero energy and zero waste in 2016. So a little bit before we started to have this time valuation of carbon discussion systematically. And they set the target of 2021 as their goal for a net zero energy campus. And they're looking at that, this, the entire airport all in that they're focused on and they're systematically working toward that. The school district um, has been cutting their energy use in, in their facilities and has set uh, specific carbon mitigation milestones because their electricity is also supplied by that the SFPC. So essentially is all greenhouse gas free and their emissions are concentrated in their, their boilers uh, at, at the school sites as well as transport. Um, City's own facilities, um, kind of same thing. We've committed to publishing and use of every facility annually uh, since 2011, and over that period, cut about a third of the carbon uh, carbon impact of the city city's uh, own operations. So that's the facilities other than the airport, largely other than the airport. Um, and then we've adopted a number of different uh, additional requirements, and they include for our own facilities need at least uh, if, they, if there isn't an agency level or city level uh, requirement for Z&E or zero carbon, it is set an actual energy budget for the building, determine if Z&E is going to be feasible at that site, and then measure and report where that target's met. Um, we also started looking at this question of resilience on a, a systematic basis and, and had this um, really interesting uh, data that we found from a collaboration between uh, PG&E, uh, other regional utilities, telecommunications utilities, and a bunch of city agencies looking at resilience and the lifelines for the community in the event of the next time we in, uh, endure a earthquake like the 1906 earthquake. So if, in the event of a, a 7.9 magnitude earthquake, the estimate is that the electric service could be restored as citywide within um, so about 95% of the city within about a week and that the natural gas distribution system would might take much more than six months to come back online. So just provision of resilience and recovery, really different timeline embedded in that. Um, and so that's the basis for now identifying where the best sites are for starting to deploy systematically solar energy storage to ensure that Critical facilities designated for disaster recovery are available in the event of a disaster and have continuity, at least of their critical loads. And that yielded asking the question, well, can we just make this question, make it as easy as possible for ourselves and, and for anyone to understand, given a particular load, how big of a solar array do you need, what sort of battery storage system makes sense uh, in order to provide service over a, you know, the design parameters you would need to design against. And so this website is available for free uh, to anyone, solarresilient.org, and we are using it for those, those projects, but um, uh, you're, you're welcome to use it as well. And now each time we build a new construction project, we also need to incorporate that into the process. <clears throat> and, and the idea here is this, these are not 
yet um, hard commitments to decarbonize or to install storage in all these sites, but going through the exercise of doing the math and having it means that the, the option's on the table and that's in the context of a number of other um, requirements. I'm gonna abbreviate some highlights in terms of green building, but essentially there's green building code amendments that apply to all new construction and the majority of uh, renovations that are based on credible third-party rating systems, LEED and, and Greenpoint rated. Um, and then there's a number of additions that have been added to those over the years, such as if you're gonna build a new building, 10 floors needs to include PV, this is of private sector, municipal, commercial, residential, is either a PV or living roof or a combination of the two. Um, similarly, uh, recognizing the need for supporting infrastructure for electric vehicle adoption and that San Francisco is a place which has very favorable demographics for EV adoption, but very problematic infrastructure for EV adoption is two thirds residents live in multifamily housing. And that, you know, particularly 100 year old multifamily housing is very unlikely to have electrical service uh, appropriate for uh, EVs. This was kind of an effort to stop digging that particular hole. It doesn't solve that whole problem, but as new construct, as new buildings are built, they need to have enough electrical service for expand, being able to expand electrical vehicle charging to any or even all spaces. Uh, some details ensue that I'm happy to talk with you online. Then we're committing immediately after that to, in our own fleet, um, if we buy a light duty vehicle, it has to be electric. If the site, that vehicle is going to be parked is one where we can't extend electricity to that vehicle then that agency has to buy a vehicle from one of the, our existing fleets so we transfer our internal combustion fleet over to those sites that we can't provide electric charging in the short term and so i think the question in front of a lot of communities at the moment is we have the 2019 standards now kind of firming up and san francisco is one of the agencies that has or one of the cities that has adopted um, amendments to the building code many times over the years to support sustainability. Uh, I don't know whether San Francisco will or not, but the first input to that is, you know, the, the same way that uh, Isaac Newton said that he stood on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, all of us only do things that are additive to, to the great leadership of the state. And, um, but if you just look around, um, you know, you have at least two city councils in the Bay Area have directly requested staff to um, provide them options for decarbonization. And I might, sorry, I didn't confer with Palo Alto making a slide, so you could argue that they should be one notch up in this. This is not meant to be a hierarchy either. Um, but then, um, you know, the four communities in the center essentially have adopted something that was intended to largely level the playing field, at least generally systematically for low-rise residential, but often for other building forms. And then you have, um, you know, San Francisco is an example of a community where there, the math doesn't add up to meet the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals unless this is, there's at least um, more options and it may make it easier for decarbonization. And then it may become something that, that we debate about whether it should be mandatory. And then if you're, um, might not be able to see it on Zoom remotely, but you know, the Air Resources Board publishes a map of all the communities statewide that have, uh, and it's not perfectly up to date, but it's a good resource to look at who set what greenhouse gas emission goal, and you could you could mine that to infer where is the implied commitment to decarbonization as well in those goals. Um, so in, in that context, um, I wanted to pass out for those who are who are present. Uh, a resource where you know a common theme in um, trying to understand both the common theme across cities is we need to understand the challenge and that's a lot of what you heard from I think from Ed today but also um, you know what are the range of options because there's a lot of care that's going into that effort but we also need to make sure that what is presented to stakeholders and the local elected officials is feasible to administer is legally viable and is um, is cost effective for, for residents and, and businesses in our community. And so that means that that, that, that implies a, a timeline for uh, the process of amending the code. If a community were to want to have, uh, to value having the, any code amendments uh, go into effect coincidence with, 
coincident with the adoption of the uh, 2019 standards. And that's very valuable for those two things to happen at the same time because you have a lot of potential complexity if on January 1, you have one, essentially one set of requirements, and then you know, January 15th, you have a different one. And you have to, just the tracking of that is complex for both the project applicants and the developers and, and, and for the city staff themselves. So it's really valuable if we could, if some change is going to occur, it's um, completed in a timely manner so that there's just one clear set of requirements. And ideally, that there's a lot of value in regional consistency as well. And so a number of Bay Area communities, part, most of them highlighted in that last slide, it asked the Bay Area, Bay Area Regional Network, which is not an advocate of any particular thing other than energy efficiency, because that's what they're funded for, uh, asked them just to provide clarity about where, the, where we are in terms of a level playing field. And so that's what this um, handout, or handout is, is trying to summarize. Um, Try to get it onto um, a couple of large sheets of paper. Um, you know, the question of where have we as a society, where's the commission, but where do we as a society have a level playing field based on what's written in the, the 2019 standards? And so the, this document, if you're listening at home or if you're waiting for the handout, really consists of a preamble page to explain that point. And then I'd encourage you to flip it over and look on the back. And there's a, a kind of color-coded section on the bottom, and that's the legend. And so there's, um, this is documents really written for, as a reference for at least two categories of people. And that includes folks like yourselves, who probably are very uh, uh, familiar with the details of standards and, and the minutia and the, where you have found workarounds and where you have challenges. And then it's also color coded for maybe folks like me, but folks who are not going to be um, necessarily developing individual projects and in, in detailed expertise in the detail of standards. I need to be able to have a reference to say, you know, where is it? Where are we sending that signal that's neutral, and where we have some room before we really provide a level playing field for the all electric versus uh, dual fuel. <clears throat> and so um, I'll leave you with that. Uh, happy to talk about it offline, but and it, this is documents complete, but we're definitely eager to get comments all the same. And I, it will be updated once the uh, alternate compliance manuals are adopted and completed, but this also is a good reference if you have um, really want to um, contribute to the conversation and encourage the commission to take every action it can in the remaining space it has before the 2019 standards are fully, fully um, cemented, the ACM and the compliance software, there are some decisions that still are being worked out that you know are really relevant to what we've been talking about the last few days. So thank you. Hey, Ann. So in the building all the cars going across yeah. and the big block and the big scram block and one of those represented buildings. I'm curious if so this is showing obviously reductions, but at the same time we're seeing tremendous growth in the city, uh -huh. particularly in tall buildings, and Bruce gave you a hint earlier, they're not I'm not a fan. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm just curious if the growth Assumptions are built into this, including the embodied carbon emissions from all that construction activity. Right. So uh, the question is two, two, two parts. Does the graph uh, summarize and Im include embodied carbon? And um, maybe it's not quite a question, but I also just want to, you yeah, know, how is growth accommodated? I want to discover that. So the first answer is no. This is this is scope two emissions. Uh, so this is how essentially all. Uh, uh, Community uh, climate action plans and carbon greenhouse gas emission inventories are, are completed. It's, it's a model that's that's performed in that that context. And so, while we have uh, performed a uh, consumption-based inventory, which does look at scope three, those upstream emissions, um, for both um, simplification of communication of the community as well, or even just the possibility of successful communication with the community. Um, as well as um, 
just the ambiguities that, that entail in looking at what our aggregate impact is, we do focus on those, those scope two emissions. Um, that said, I think, you know, given the emphasis on the reason that we've done the consumption inventory in the past has been largely driven by those waste related goals. And the result of those inventories are very consistent with, with what, uh, what was presented that, um, the, and that's part of why whenever we do present the pie chart version of our total uh, carbon uh, emissions, even in this type of accounting regime, this, it's, sorry to make this overly complicated, even when you're looking at it in this narrow way, we still always include the wedge for waste when it, it's around via this accounting mechanism around seven or eight percent of emissions because that's the wedges come out differently in a, a consumption-based inventory, but it's still representative of those, those greater emissions in, in other sectors. And so it's putting materials back to productive uses and at the end of their useful life is one essential element of that, but it doesn't address the short answer, long answer is um, no. Uh, <laughs> but then your second question about what about growth, uh, that is embedded in here. So that's that's the first two bars is um, thir three bars is first bar is our 1990 emissions, second bar is 2015 emissions, and third bar is the common operational implications of some the energy code in effect to the essentially the 2013 energy standards combined with the turnover in building stock combined with expected cons construction and expected long-term population growth, basically all awash. Uh, and then these other, those boxes are where you can yield reductions from that through efficiency, both in efficiency and transport and, and buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Simple question. You said that uh, if we had, if there were batteries and everything was up to date, but it didn't pencil out with San Francisco, how much of the economy being out for two months compared to one week, how much loss? of economic power or, or like the cost of that mm -hmm. has that been factored in <clears throat> so there for the so the question is uh for the solar the economic analysis underlying solar and storage uh investment decisions are we considering economic impacts of of resilience yeah um yes but the, at the same time in the event of a 7.9 earthquake um there will be an economic impact and disruption. And so the uncertainty about the effect of that is kind of overwhelming. And so what we are looking at uh, more closely that, that is more, um, rep we think is more predictable is the, you know, the solar and storage system both have financial value just in normal day-to-day op -day operation. And then the, in the event of a disaster, um, all those facilities, the community's plan is essentially to bring Diesel backup generators, for which we do have contracts in place to have them procure, have them provided in the event of a disaster, to provide continuity of power at places that are determined to be necessary for that particular disaster. So there's both a plan and an acknowledgement that there is a need for adaptation. And I should say, before I say another sentence, that that's also all the work of other agencies, the the, the Department of Emergency Management, and many others, of which I have only both a citizens level understanding as well as our understanding from working with them try to support them with this project but there's a basic implication there that that party who's going to deliver those generators has to be able to physically get to that site and there's a valuation issue there that that uh an event that big that will be an issue particularly in the first 72 hours um and then second uh data published by the energy one of the things energy commission works on is uh reliability of energy in all forms for California. And so their data implies that, you know, because there's, we're largely isolated from the rest of the country for a lot of good reasons, both physical and our emission standards, then one of those events will also mean that there's essentially a finite amount of fuel on the West Coast and a uncertain amount of time until liquid fuels could be delivered here. Um, and so, that's one of the other things we're trying to work through is there's just value in 
on one hand, there will be prioritization of liquid fuel for disaster recovery in that type of event, and we, the federal government would be involved. And so there's a lot of things that are a little, that are good and hard to predict, but there's just value in that resource not going to that one site, but remaining available for other uses. Well, let me choose a question. I saw Alice had a hand up already. Hold on. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to wait while Alice looking. Go ahead, Nia. Yeah, yeah. No, I have a great question. You, you were showing the, the Bay Area airport is agreed to do to get down to, to near zero. Yeah. My understanding is that the, the elevation of the airport will be underwater by 2050, and the kind of seawall around that is impractical because of the, the landing patterns. But why make the why put an investment in an airport that's not going to be usable in 2050? Um. I've heard the answer to that question. I I, I have to dodge that. Like I, I I don't work for the airport, and I have heard a technical answer to that. And I don't think I'm the person to give a good response to. It, other than a, they dispute a, some of those yeah, premises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Alice is behind you. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna oh, wait. Uh, transportation is Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, well, yes and no. The um, that uh, regional transport it, it 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 is a VMT measurement, but it's VMT once you've crossed one of the bridges uh, or uh, otherwise enter the city. And the reason is we try to do this, and we debated that point, but we need to make sure that we are consistent with our the power transit agency also does its GHG planning. So there is. There's also regional efforts as well. So it's this isn't the only way to answer. Scale matters, I guess, is the short answer. So some things have to be managed at a local scale and some things are regional. Last question is yours, Alice. Uh, okay, thank you. The, was there any other, um, how did you do your greenhouse gas in order to get the, to the CU specifically tool? Uh, no, no, in this case, uh, the company uh, Siemens came to us and offered to perform this analysis with us. It was called the City uh, Performance Tool. And sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. Is that open source? No. Uh, and so they, uh, you know, we, we accepted their their offer because uh, we had goals and we had some projections that are starting to age. And it's great to have a engineering company donating time for that purpose. Um, we are currently doing similar analysis internally using the Curb tool. So that's a product of uh, Bloomberg and the World Bank. Uh, and the reason that we are using that is that look, this has the benefit of we probably took a lot more of Siemens time than they initially expected and <laughs> but we can actually run scenarios internally with that other tool. And the last, the last, it's not a question but a comment of the direction for the Roberts I don't know but oh no we got yay. Um I didn't think you gave the city of San Francisco enough credit in the reasons why they did perform so well and I'd like to say two things the progressive green building code, like one of the first cities with a really great green building code that was well enforced. And second of all, SF environment. Your entire department of people whose job it is, right? Yeah. Dedicated to the city code. So that's all. <laughs>